Hey everyone, Noah Zerbe here. This is one of a series of short videos looking at the environment in the context of international relations. This video focuses in particular on the issue of climate change as it relates to global politics, so let's get to it. The contemporary debate over climate change reflects broader historical dynamics in the global political economy. The countries and regions most vulnerable to devastation as a result of global climate change have the least historical responsibility in causing those changes and the least ability to adapt to the changes. The paradox is captured by the idea of climate justice, which we'll explore in just a couple of moments. These maps highlight the environmental dimensions of inequality embodied in the issue of global climate change. On the top, we see CO2 emissions. Countries in red release the greatest amount of CO2, countries in green the least. At the bottom, we see mortality rates associated with climate change. Countries in red experience the highest rates of mortality, countries in green the lowest. Note the paradox here. The countries most responsible for global greenhouse gas emissions bear little of the impact, while the countries least responsible for emissions pay the highest costs. Scientists have already identified a number of impacts from global climate change. Most observers believe that the Earth's changing climate will result in larger and more frequent wildfires across expanding areas, like those experienced across the western United States, Russia, Brazil, and Australia, among others, in recent years. Longer periods of drought and associated crop losses, increasing intensity and frequency of tropical storms, rising global sea levels and a corresponding increase in coastal flooding and a decline in freshwater availability, a loss of global biodiversity as plant and animal species struggle to adapt to a drier and warmer climate, an increase in the spread of tropical diseases like malaria due to warmer environments, and spread of pests like pine beetles which are now able to survive more mild winters, and even total ecosystem collapse as the world's oceans rot warm and the ability to carry oxygen is reduced, leading to collapse of global fish stocks and coral bleaching around the world. And in perhaps the most dramatic impact, countries like the Maldives or Seychelles could cease to exist altogether as they're swallowed by the sea. Some 44 countries have joined the alliance of small island states, and most of these are relatively poor developing countries. They're also particularly vulnerable to climate change, as the vast majority of their collective territory is less than a meter or three feet above sea level. In 2009, the cabinet of the government of Maldives, a chain of islands in the Indian Ocean, held a cabinet meeting underwater to draw attention to the threat posed by climate change. The move was intended to pressure the developing world to agree to binding targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and was held to coincide with the UN Climate Summit meeting in Copenhagen, Denmark. A cabinet meeting with a difference. The president of the Maldives, Mohamed Nasheed, and 13 other politicians donned their scuba gear and headed to the bottom of the sea. They communicated using hand signals and whiteboards. Each politician even had his own name badge on the table. Those who took part had trained for two months. Although it may look like fun, there is a serious reason for holding this meeting, to raise awareness of how vulnerable the Maldives are to climate change. If Maldives cannot be saved today, we do not feel that there is much of a chance for the rest of the world. With their coral reefs and white sandy beaches, the Maldives are a popular destination for tourists. But most of these islands in the Indian Ocean lie just a few feet above sea level. If the sea level rises by a matter of inches, these islands will become uninhabitable. Today, cabinet members signed a document calling on all countries to cut down their carbon emissions. It comes ahead of a key UN conference on climate change being held in Copenhagen in December. Juliana Needham, Sky News. The president of the Maldives, Mohamed Nasheed, said, We are trying to send a message to let the world know what is happening and what will happen to the Maldives if something isn't done about climate change. If the climate summit fails, we are going to die. The meeting of the cabinet of the government of Maldives also drew attention to the global migration crisis that will likely stem from climate change as territory inhabited for generations becomes uninhabitable due to desertification, sea level rise, intensified seasonal weather disruptions, or other climate-related factors. To be clear, this is not a new phenomenon. In the 1930s, Americans fled the Dust Bowl as climate refugees in the United States. But what's different now is the scale of that change. 
According to the United Nations International Organization on Migration, there will likely be between 150 and 200 million climate refugees by 2050, as individuals around the world are forced to flee rising sea levels and coastal erosion. Efforts to address climate change are generally divided into two categories, mitigation and adaption. Mitigation refers to efforts to prevent climate change from taking place. This includes all efforts to reduce emission levels, whether through international agreements or new, less polluting technologies. More radical proposals for geoengineering, for example, of releasing aerosols into the atmosphere to reflect sunlight and thus cool the Earth's surface, would also be an example of mitigation. Adaption refers to efforts to learn to live with the impact of climate change. Here we might think of developing more drought-tolerant crops or expanding rainwater storage to limit the impacts of drought, uh, constructing seawalls to protect low-lying coastal areas, or retreating from such areas altogether. While the science of climate change is generally accepted, the politics and economics of climate change are much more contested. Debates over mitigation and adaption strategies have been complicated by a number of factors. These include both a number of economic and political issues. Economically, there are large costs associated with both addressing global climate change and with failing to address it. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions and slowing global rising temperatures will be an expensive undertaking as countries shift away from oil-based economies to economies fueled by different, more sustainable resources. But the cost of not taking action is likely to be even higher as the full impact of a 2 degrees Celsius plus increase in global mean temperatures will have a devastating impact on our built world. As part of this shift, as we just noted, there's need to find alternative sources of energy. In 2010, more than 91% of global energy consumption was derived from fossil fuels and other non-carbon neutral sources. Development of alternative energy sources will be an expensive but necessary step in constructing a post-carbon future. And in this context, the question of economic development in the global south is not going away. While the carbon-intensive path followed by the global north may not be sustainable, until an alternative form of sustainable development is widely available, affordable, and successful, developing countries will continue to pursue a more carbon-intensive form of development to improve their economic prosperity and their standards of living. There are also political dimensions of addressing climate change. These include distributional aspects that need to be addressed politically. If no substantive action is taken to address global climate change, the impacts of climate change will be borne disproportionately by the countries of the global south. But those countries are neither the ones primarily responsible for greenhouse gas emissions that cause the problem, nor are they well positioned economically to deal with those impacts. How to address these dynamics is usually termed climate justice and will likely be a central concern of global politics in the coming decade. And, as we've already noted, the challenges posed by the collective goods nature of the problem, which encourages free riding, also needs to be overcome. Further, the rivalry between major greenhouse gas emitters like the United States and China will likely continue to present an obstacle to political progress at the international level. Let's conclude by briefly considering some of the implications of climate change for international relations as we've traditionally thought of it. Let's start with the idea of sovereignty. As we've already noted, rising global sea levels threaten to inundate low-lying island states, making them uninhabitable and ultimately perhaps even submerging them entirely. But what happens to a state if their territory disappears? Are they still entitled to the rights and responsibilities of statehood? Will other states continue to recognize them? Will they retain their ability to participate in international forums like the United Nations? And what about their treaty rights under international law? Would they retain territorial claims and jurisdiction to the areas previously occupied? Or are they now subject to treaty provisions outlined in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea? And what about their citizens? Would the people of this country, which now lacks any physical territory, retain their citizenship? Do they become stateless persons? And even more practically, where do they go? Do other states have an obligation to take them in? The very idea of a deterritorialized state runs against the idea of the Westphalian state system, and it forces us to rethink these central questions in international relations and international law. And remember that these are not just abstract political experiments. Already, many small island Pacific states, including Tuvalu, Kiribati, and the Marshall Islands, uh, as well as others, are experiencing sea level rise and ocean water is inundating agricultural land, making it unproductive, while also contaminating sources of fresh drinking water. And many of these countries have maximum elevations of less than 12 feet, making them particularly vulnerable. Climate change has also been connected to the idea of climate security, particularly in the developed world. 
Put simply, climate security is a field operating at the intersection of climate change and national security. In 2018, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, basically the cabinet-level official responsible for overseeing the U.S. intelligence community, released its annual threat assessment, which included the following assessment. The past 115 years have been the warmest period in history of modern civilization, and the past few years have been the warmest years on record. Extreme weather events in a warmer world have the potential for greater impacts and can compound with other drivers to raise the risk of humanitarian disasters, conflict, water and food shortages, population migration, labor shortfalls, price shocks, and power outages. Research has not identified indicators of tipping points in climate-linked Earth systems, suggesting a possibility for abrupt climate change. This finding was a sharp break from the official position of the U.S. government, though not a surprising one. In many ways, the U.S. military and intelligence community has been well ahead of the rest of the U.S. government in its assessment of national security threats posed by climate change. Indeed, in 2014, the Quadrennial Defense Review, the global threat assessment produced by the U.S. Department of Defense every four years, concluded that as greenhouse gas emissions increase, sea levels are rising, average global temperatures are increasing, and severe weather patterns are accelerating. Climate change may exacerbate water scarcity and lead to sharp increases in food costs. The pressure caused by climate change will influence resource competition while placing additional burdens on economies, societies, and governance institutions around the world. These effects are threat multipliers that will aggravate stressors abroad, such as poverty, environmental degradation, political instability, and social tensions, conditions that can enable terrorist activity and other forms of violence. Thus, the national security and intelligence officials are viewing climate change as a serious threat that needs to be considered as part of the national security and foreign policy agenda. So that concludes our very brief overview of the international relations of climate change. I hope you found it useful. Please leave any questions you have in the comments section below, and thanks for watching everyone. Have a good day. Bye.